Thank you for inviting, and um, Vanessa, too. Thanks for helping organize everything. And also, I have to thank Kim, uh, who works also at Weber, um, who sort of introduced me to the idea of Creative Mornings. And I remember hearing the term Creative Mornings and thinking, how is that possible? How does, how, it's as likely as a uh, no-drink account management lunch or something. You know, like, that seemed <laughs> quite possible. Um, but I learned more about it. It seemed like something would be really great. And I was, um, is this echoing really bad? Is that just me? Um, thank you. So the, um, the reason I think this is a really important talk and uh, maybe an important group of people to talk to about is, for one thing, I want to talk about digital media and I want to talk about social media and I want to talk about media and advertising and marketing and how we as creatives work within it. And I think it's important right now because there's so much talk going on right now about this media or this medium and about digital from the left brain perspective, from the perspective of analysts and pundits and the Seth Godins of the world who are all extremely smart, extremely bright, and bringing a lot of knowledge to this table, but all from this hemisphere of the brain. And creatives tend to think about things a little bit differently and they look at things a little differently. And I don't think our voice as creatives about what is happening in this industry is being represented as much. And so the words we get every day in the blogs and the newspapers and the, and the articles online all sort of tend to be analytical, and there's a lot of infographics, and there's a lot of like data around the stuff, and it all is true. All that stuff makes sense, but it doesn't necessarily come from the same place that we as a group think about, which is more from the heart, more emotionally, and more uh, deeply connected to the human condition and how it affects us. And so I want to talk about that and sort of reposition and, and talk about the industry that we're all in and our role as creatives in it from the perspective of creatives and, and our voice, because I think it's underrepresented. So that's sort of why I'm here today. Um, and I think it's an important time because there's a shift happening and I think an evolution in, in as creatives what is what we're responsible for and what is going to make for good portfolios and, and make good work going on as digital and new technologies work their way into our daily lives and how we consume media. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I Let's see. I, what first, it, I think in order for us as creatives to understand it, we, we tend to want to look at it from the human perspective. So. I brought uh, two things to show you to sort of uh, get an understanding of where people are right now and their connection to technology and the emotional component of it, this sort of underrepresented area of it. So one thing, um, that's me, I wanted to show you was this that I saw online I thought was really interesting. So this, this um, in, the, in the shootings in Colorado um, recently, the coverage, as you know, was, was um, fairly complete in its usual sense, the, you know, from the news perspective and, and uh, media coverage was all over it. But there was one kind of coverage that I hadn't really seen before, which was a guy on Reddit who was taking um, and calling what he saw were the people who were actually on, on scene, so the people who were witnesses and victims and, um, and the police broadcasts. Um, so the very specific data around what was happening from people actually experiencing it, and he was logging it all second by second, minute by minute of what was happening. When you read through this, um, as I did, it's actually very emotional. Uh, in fact, I, I cried reading it, um, mostly because it was devoid of that filter that media brings to it from newscasters and political bias and the packaging um, of news that happens to us, even within the 24-hour news cycle. So to be able to see just the raw data, the raw information of what was happening out there and see it, and not all of it is right, but it is all the accounting of people from, it in, from, an, from a human standpoint, and to see it happening, com coming down in real time, suddenly made it more emotional. And to me, that's the core of what digital brings and, and what this medium brings, is a, is a very human connection devoid of packaging and, and in some ways marketing, which is what we do. But I think that's the emotional impact of the medium that, that um, makes this perhaps the most connected media that we have available to us. And um, someone once said, uh, I remember early on when I, when I first got to um, my last agency, um, it was a guy I won't name whose name was on the door at the agency, Deutsch, uh, who said that, uh, that, we, that, he, that the medium will never be as effective, digital will never be as effective as anything else because it doesn't have the emotional impact. No one's going to cry at the internet. And I think that was actually true a little bit at the time, but I think it's because we were missing 
some of the point of, what, of how people interact with the medium. And I, and I brought one other thing, which is a video, and it's actually 10 minutes long, so I apologize for the length, but I do, it just came out, and it's these two directors in Canada who put together, what they wanted to show was a bit of a sketch um, or overview of what our emotional connection is today with technology and, and digital media. And I think it's really interesting, really fascinating to see how, how we are connected and see it reflected back to us. I think sometimes uh, we only really get it when we look at it sometimes up on a screen and see other people doing it. But you'll see yourself in this. And I think it's a really interesting video. So um, bear with this. We'll play this for a few minutes and then um, we'll talk about its impact. Everyone knows I'm dating a douchebag. 
like you were tagged in a bunch of pictures grinding away on some spray tan skink, you idiot. And I'm supposed to believe that's all some kind of misunderstanding? <laughs> I've stood by you too many times when you embarrass me. Do you really think I need you? I'm young, I'm sexy, I'm independent, beholden to no man. Uh, this coffee's awful. I'm so sorry, Mr. Bringer. I'm so sorry, I'll get right on it. We're done. It's over. Don't try to call me. Don't try to contact me. You've been blocked. XO. Bitch! God, you're so cheap! Oh, come on, Lord Tunis. Don't be such a little bitch. <laughs> Thought you'd like getting raped by a girl. <laughs> <laughs> you are so dead. Oh, oh, oh! Gotcha! Oh, come on! My ass! Oh, yeah. Talk dirty to me. I love it. But how about giving me a little bit of foreplay? Now, we... Lightly grazing my lips over every inch of your body, whispering how badly I want you, I need you. And after worshipping every curve and contour, I'll finally slip those panties off. All right, Jeff. That's right. Next. Next. Oh. Hey. You promise you won't show anyone. I will. Promise. Promise, babe. Okay. I love you. I love you too. I'd kick her out on the street. I would kill her. What? Do the world a favor and kill yourself. I can't take it anymore. I'm so alone. No one cares. No one listens. Everyone hates me. I'm so tired of being invisible. Comment karma. Clearly, Reddit likes having you around. Let's get this post to the front page. Let's show her how much the internet loves her. I bought her Reddit gold. Here are the links to her Facebook and Twitter account. Friend requested. Following. I found her Tumblr. Like all of the posts. None of us have to be forever alone anymore. We've all got each other now. Welcome to the internet.
Um, pretty good, right? I think that's, um, what I like about it is it gets exactly what we were talking about. This whole, I think it, the conclusion is really the point all along. We, the, there's this, this uh, you don't have to be alone. There's, there's this ability to reach people, uh, which I think was in, in a way the point of the Aurora shooting uh, thing too. There's, we can be connected to people and feel um, the human condition and feel people from, from any distance through the use of this media, and that's what, that's what makes it so powerful, right? So, um, so let's get back to, I, I love that image, by the way, of the, uh, the parents watching TV and the kids, you know, like, and they're like disgusted at the kids, which is so funny, because like in my generation, you were disgusted at the people watching TV, you know, like, why don't you come talk to us for a while instead of watching TV, and like, it's funny how it's all shifted. So, um, meanwhile, they're not even talking to each other, they're just watching television, and they're like mad that the kids aren't paying attention to them, you know? So, um, so back to the creative perspective. So I want to talk a little bit um, theoretically for a second about how creatives look at media in general. So um, you know we've had a lot of practice talking about television and print and radio and, and, other, and outdoor and a lot of others. And I think um, the, the clues to how we as the creative community need to look at online lie in the same way we look at everything else, any other media type, which really comes down to two things. The first is we always look at the basic materials. So we want to know what we're working with. If we were painters, we'd want to know the, about the pigments and the colors and the state of the canvas and the, and the sable brushes. We want to know because within that, within the details of the things we work with lie the answers to how we're going to work and the rules with, within, within which we work. So I know that there is a certain quality to paint that sculpture doesn't have and that photography doesn't have. And so I know what the materials I'm working with and as creative we long to know those things so that we know what the rules are and, and where we can go from there. And if you look at television, our basic materials, we're talking about moving pictures and sound, of course. And if you're looking at print, our basic materials are ink and paper. And if you're looking at radio, our basic material is sound, right? So those are the basic materials, the things we need to understand. That's our expertise. Um, and then on the other side of it, I think what creatives look for is almost the other end of that spectrum, which is what is the most heightened emotional impact that that medium can have. What's the potential, the emotional potential of it? And let's aspire to that. So if we're talking about TV, we're talking about moving pictures and sound, the most heightened emotional impact of that is movies. So that's what we look at as the thing we aspire to, to reach the most, to reach people emotionally. If we're looking at ink and paper, uh, we're looking at a medium that the most, um, the most impact we could have would be paintings, would be fine art. That's where the artist truly expresses himself or herself, and that is where we can sit down and enjoy something graphic, something visual, and feel an emotional connection to, to what that message is. So those are the things we've been aspiring to. Funny enough, um, sound, the most emotional impact we can have is music. And I think what's interesting, and it's sort of a testament to how much we as creatives need to sort of prove to ourselves and to everyone else that we're having this emotional connection, is the fact that we never put radio ads in our portfolios, right? Because we can never do music. So we're always doing this sort of like half step to something extraordinarily emotional. Um, and so it doesn't, we don't value it as much. Whereas we'd love to put a little piece of video in our portfolios. We'd love to put a beautiful print piece in our portfolios. Because we know that if we do it really well, we're, we're hitting up against that, that emotional place that the artists of the world are hitting against too. So I think those are the things we look at at creative, as creatives. I think we need to apply that same filter to digital and to, and to new media. Um, but it poses some problems, right? What are the basic materials of digital or of the internet? Um, if you were an art director, you might say pixels. If you were a technologist, you might say code. Um, but the truth is, those aren't the basic building blocks of the internet because I could show you uses of media that don't include code and don't include pixels. So uh, for it to be true, for it to be a basic element, it needs to be present in everything that goes on with that, within that medium. Um, I, I would assume, I, I would think that the basic materials of the internet are packet switching. Um, which is not a very romantic vision, not, a, not a, a piece of material that any of us fully understand or probably could explain to anyone very well or very easily. Um, so it's a very difficult thing for us to get our heads around as creatives, and I think that's created some of this dissonance in terms of how we talk about it. So I think we have to redefine packet switching um, in terms of something more human, and I think the natural term is networking. Um, and in fact, I think the net part of internet stands for networking, right? So I think that's been thought of before. That is the way we sort of humanize it to an extent. I don't think it's human enough, and we'll get to that. But the idea of networking really is the perfect metaphor for it. And I think the, the, the metaphor we could, in, the, in the today's, you know, even right here, would for um, what we're doing right now would be a perfect metaphor for the internet. Um, a networking event where we all get together and, um, you know, have, have some sort of shared interest. And I think therein lies some of the understanding of what is, what is powerful about this medium. And if you think about it, what, it, it's, it'd be very easy to think that, what, that this speech 
is the purpose of this event, and it's not as much as it would uh, uh, please me for it to be, but the, the purpose of this event is creative mornings and for a gathering of creative people to have a discussion and a conversation of some kind. The speech is the fire at the, camp, at, at the campgrounds that people gather around, but it really, and, and a lot of talk these days is happening about content online, and a lot of focus is happening on content. Content is only the thing that we all gather around. The discussion around it is really what the power of the medium is for. So um, I think the, the further we push it um, into our understanding of what's important about this medium is to go from this idea of networking to the idea of conversation. And conversation is really what this medium inspires. So if we, so going back to the creator's perspective, the basic materials, a conversation, what is the most heightened emotional connection we have to conversation, and that I think we do know. I think, I think that is a very creative place. The art of conversation is a real thing. It's a real art. So, to, um, so like in any medium, we look to the greats. We look to who is doing it well, who has done it the best in the world. And I don't think, um, you know, I, I don't think anyone would argue that Socrates is probably you know, the founder of the notion of conversation and great conversation. Um, who's a man who never wrote anything down. There are no Socrates writings, and yet we understand him as the greatest Western philosopher of our time um, and spawned everything we, you know, our basic structure of understanding of philosophy and thought in Western civilization from a man who never wrote anything down. All his, all his teachings and all his thoughts are uh, transcribed by Plato, sitting over here with not facing him, um, in, through conversations, um, and maybe a little bit with Credo holding his leg over there. Everyone else freaking out. Um, while the two of them, sort of, you know, the two philosophers, you know, with him and, and disciples of him, sort of understand, and how badass is Socrates, by the way, who is on his deathbed for having uh, spoken truths that no one wanted to hear, and you know, taking the hemlock and, and still, proth uh, you know, proselytizing about his beliefs while everyone around him is freaking out, and his wife's leaving. Um, the guy was, the guy was pretty intense. But what made, what made him so great is, is not necessarily his oration skills and how great he was at, although he was, I'm sure. Um, but his thoughts. It was his thoughts that really changed the world and, and changed everything. This is a man who believed in right over might, and he's, taking, he's talking about this to the Greeks. These are the Greeks. You're talking about, about the idea of might not being a big deal to these guys. They've done nothing but fight their entire existence, and he's trying to tell them that you need to do what's right, not what's the most, what, what, what represents strength. He's telling them uh, to, to revere self-development over material goods to the Greeks. How do you, you know, how do you think they're taking, they're, they send him to his death over these, over these thoughts, you know? The guy was a heretic, he was a rebel, he was a punk, and, um, and he was killed for his thoughts, you know? So I think that is at the core of what we as a creative community need to be doing, which is we need to um, be thinking of ourselves along these lines. We need to be making a difference, we need to be pushing against the status quo, the gadfly as they call him. We need to be that person, we need to be that thing the thing that ignites and the thing that changes people's minds and pushes against what everyone else out there is saying. No matter how statistically correct it is, we know in our hearts, because we're creatives, what is correct from that side of the brain, and that's every bit as relevant as the other side. So let's talk about how that gets done. Um, well, inciting, I think, is an important part of what needs to be uh, the briefs that come, in, that come uh, to us as creative people, or if you guys are the ones who create briefs, um, I think inciting needs to be something we think about not just what is the insight, S-I-G-H-T, but insight, C-I-T-E. So how do we make sure that the, the ideas we're putting out there are changing things, or challenging people, challenging notions. notions. So uh, here's a little write-up of what I like to think about when we, um, when we start thinking about a brief. It's called the insight statement. It's designed to get people talking, get them to do something, have an emotion, share, converse, post, and comment, even just to make someone think. The insight statement of our creative brief calls for this, demands it stands straight up and unignorably suggests it. It is the zag to culture's tired zig. It's the counterpoint to a widely held belief. It's the tipping over of a sacred cow. And when someone reads it, they're likely to say, hmm, tell me more, I hadn't thought of that. Or maybe, yes, I've been thinking exactly that, but I was afraid to say it. It's a realization that the world is about to come to, but being the first to outright claim it. And maybe without our help, they never would. But this is the tricky work. It must be, it must be real. Not necessarily bound by the laws of physics, but resonating inside is true. What's more, it has to be thought, it has to be a thought that this particular audience will cheer for, wear on their hats, create a hashtag for. And to make it triply complex, it must somehow get your very specific brand message across. That's a lot of things, but they're all as important as the idea itself. In fact, without it, there likely isn't an idea. Because this isn't just about finding out that Pepsi tastes better than Coke in a blind taste test, no. This is about a stance that sets one brand apart from another at its core. 
Smell like a man, not a lady. Small cars are more fun. Nobody knows drama like us. The statement doesn't have to be long, just epically committed to itself. Most people are afraid to say the hard thing. Most people are afraid to commit to a singular idea. Most people are afraid to stand up for a challenging notion. To get our clients to compete and win in their world, we cannot be most people. Do not hold back on the insight statement. Be bold, rebel, take a position, get a little mad. One line can change the course of everything. This is that line, write it well. So this is meant to be, no one will ever read this, but the, because it's way too long for anyone writing a brief and we know they have to get it done in 30 minutes and they're gonna just write what they write. But if we're looking at that statement as creatives, even if we have to go invent it, this is the kind of motivation that I think we need to have. Uh, because without it, we're doing the work that we're not gonna care about, no one else is gonna care about. And we have the potential in this medium to do work that reaches everybody in a very impactful way. So who are the rebels today? Who are the, who are the Socrateses? Who are the people who are out there um, saying the unsayable? Um, I think it's guys like this. Um, Eli Braden writes for The Stern Show, um, among other things. He's a funny, funny dude. And uh, he does, he, I can't, I mean, there's lots of people like him. But he's just one example of someone who I think just is doing that little bit of, you know, tweaking the nose of popular culture and, and, and convention. Um, I love some, some of these, like, what he, this isn't all he does is comment on stupid things that celebrities are saying, but it's one of the funniest things he does. And so, like Paris Hilton says, just ran into my friend Magic Johnson, love him. And he goes, must be weird talking to someone who's accomplished something in life. Um, so he just, and my favorite, uh, which got 340 uh, retweets, uh, was when K uh, Khloe Kardashian goes, why are all the flights sold out today? And he goes, because all the tickets were purchased. <laughs> Just so great, like it's like, it has that quality of even that, that sort of like the Aurora shooting thing, you know, he is just saying it like it is. He is just saying the truth and bringing truth to this craziness of celebrity uh, tweeting about nonsense out there. But if you look at it, he's also doing it to brands. So um, what, you know, Applebee's tweets, what's your number one reason for coming in Applebee's? And he says, take a piss during a road trip. <laughs> so again, just that like straight up truth, hit you between the eyes, truth of it. And I think it's important for us as creatives to know this going on because a lot of people are gonna ask us to write those tweets, right? And we have to be aware that, this, that, that these are the people who are inciting and this is us, we need to be those people. We can't be the tweeters saying this stupid, like inane stuff out there. We gotta be the Eli Bradens of the world, right? So that's what we're aspiring to. Um, I just put this in for fun because it got 505 replies and, um, and it's the kind of thing that I think is just, has this, from a writing perspective, has this honesty to it that I, I just think is really funny so, uh, and, and interesting. So I took some Ambien and I tripped out. I went into my mom's room to say goodnight and I don't remember anything. She said that I got really pissed at her because we were living in the Keebler elf tree and she was visiting other trees. Then I started laughing hysterically and she goes, what's so funny? And I go, there are seven people sitting on my knees. And she goes, doesn't that hurt? And I said, no, we're sitting in a bowl. And then I capped it off and said, join the crazy train, bro, and passed out. <laughs> well, I just think that's a great piece, great piece of writing, right? Yeah, it's a good piece of writing. Um, because it's just so honest and true and like we talk and, and straight up and it's the kind of thing that gets it gets responses. It just has an honesty to it and a craziness to it that people respect. Um, so there's a campaign I know you guys all know, but I think it's important to remind ourselves of um, because it's starting, it, it, I think it's one of the first campaigns that really opened this box up for creative minds to think, oh, there is this idea of improvisational response to media is an opportunity for us as, as creative people uh, within this industry. We don't just have to, what I call post and pray, which is go make a, a piece of video of some kind or a printout of some kind, throw it up and hope it gets accolades it can next year. We can start to think of marketing as a dialogue back and forth, this conversation between the audience and what we're doing for a brand. So I think this is one of the first ones to really do it well. Alyssa Milano tweets, um, are you sitting down? Sit down. Ready? The old Spice guy sent me roses. Hello, Alyssa. So you received the roses. I hope they arrived at your doorstep looking as fresh and as beautiful as you do when you appear on my TV. At this point, it's probably obvious to you as it is to me that we are in a long-term committed relationship. And in order for our love-filled trust explosion to continue and prosper, the next step is wildly obvious to you because you're a woman. So tell me what to do next. So you guys may recall this dialogue between him and Alyssa Milano went on, I don't know, four or five different videos were made. Um, but he also did it with Kevin Rose and a bunch of others and the just regular tweeters. And it was a whole three-day, I think, exchange where tweets were coming in, writers were sitting on set, 
um, taking this stuff in and they were making videos in response to it, um, really started, I think, opened our minds to what's possible in terms of dialogue. Um, here's a campaign we did at Weber Shamwick, which um, you know, is at a different scale, um, uh, but had some interesting dialogue back and forth as well, which was during, you guys remember the lockout, the NBA lockout, Dwayne Wade um, posted something about, I guess I'm gonna need a summer job, and we got on on behalf of Kentucky Fried Chicken and wrote an open letter to him to say, hey, since you need a job, how about uh, coming over to Kentucky Fried Chicken, which he actually worked at when he was younger, and so it created this dialogue, got picked up. I don't think he ever did it, but the press and the articles and the and the responses from commenters was really good, and it had that kind of back and forth dialogue. So I think we're starting to see how what we do as creatives can enter into this realm of conversation, uh, emotional impact, um, and we're starting to see what that bar is for what we can do with this medium. Um, what I'd like to talk about is how that uh, forays into uh, your guys' work and your portfolios and something really tactical for you. This is uh, the, uh, the website over here on the left of Jason Wolski, who's sitting right over here, actually. A fantastic writer who you should uh, hire at every opportunity. Um, but what I think is interesting about his, and he didn't know I was going to do this, but uh, <laughs> what I think is interesting about his portfolio and many others is that it's not just a uh, you know, sort of an opportunity to go see his work, which is fantastic, but there is link to stuff that's not work, as you see down here on the lower left. And if you hit work today, uh, you'll bring up another side of his that he's kept for, I don't know how many years you've had this, five years, something like that, at least. Um, of just stuff he sees every day at work. And um, it's the kind of thing, if you know Jason, you know his, his, his skewed perspective on the world. It's a really interesting look at, at what he sees and his view from inside an agency. And it, what it does, I, I, for me, is it says the guy understands the medium. He understands that it's more than just, here's my work. It's, I'm involved in this community. I'm involved in conversation. I'm involved in my relationship with my job and the community of people that I work with. And that, I think, is as e equally important in one's portfolio um, an understanding of that. And you know, there's lots of ways to do this. This is a guy we also worked with, John Avery, um, who has a blog attached to his portfolio, which I, I don't think is totally uncommon, but it, ta it tackles subjects you know, in a way that Socrates might, philosophically. Um, he's interested in what people are doing and different ways of looking at it. And I think it's just a, um, you know, I just think it's a way that we all need to sort of update our portfolios and update what we do to include the conversation and our understanding of the medium and what makes the, an emotional impact on it so that we can continue to do the work that we're proud of, um, that make us happy and that we're proud to show everyone else. And then um, this was a guy, Greg Smirlo, a writer at Deutsch, who um, created this meme, Selleck Waterfall Sandwich, I don't know if you guys saw, but um, just basically takes Photoshop and takes pictures of Tom Selleck, pictures of waterfalls, pictures of sandwiches, and that's it. <laughs> um, and it was, uh, it became this huge thing. I mean, it was picked up by media everywhere and Tom Selleck was asked about it on Conan O'Brien and you know, like it just sort of blew up into this thing because it's random and funny and great. Um, but again, like as a writer, you know, like that, that shows, it shows your understanding of the medium. You know, he's not just a guy who's gonna be making headlines. You know that from this guy. So I'd encourage all of you guys to create your own memes and your own things to get followers and pay attention, you know, pay attention to its effect. There's no reason on, the, on this great earth that I should be four points away from Lee Clow on anything, um, and yet I am, for what reason? Because I converse, because those icons under my name, I have more of them than he does. He has three, and I have whatever, eight, and probably more beyond that, because, because I'm everywhere. I'm on Instagram, and I'm on Twitter, and I have three different Twitter accounts, and I have different blogs I keep, and I care about this. It's all I wanna do is connect with people on the world. And Lee Clow is, you know, is far, far superior creative genius than me, but, and, and you know, his score I think is a testament to that, but not as interested in the, in the dialogue you know, necessarily, not, at least not as represented by this. So your clout, even though clout may or may not be a signifier of your creativity or your worth or your value, um, at least we are starting to see some documentation of you know, the value around social and your ability to galvanize audiences and have an effect on people around you. So pay attention to these kinds of things um, because that's gonna be important in your careers as well. And then lastly, I want to talk, uh, I'm just going to end on one thing. And it's just a story, it's just another example of a um, piece of creative on the internet. A guy named Zay Frank, who you may or may not know, started off in the agency world and then went off to go do really interesting work online, really gathering people together and doing community, almost art projects in a way. So this project, um, he, he had a following and people would obviously communicate with him and send him requests for things. He's very creative, so he's always making things like music and websites and little animations and graphics and fun stuff. But it always, it, there was always one through line, which is it involved other people. It was always a community effort, which I think is at the heart of this. I think he really gets this medium. So someone sent him an email and basically said, I'm a fan of your music. Um, 
but I wonder if you can make a song for me. I've, not, I've been feeling really down and upset. I've just moved to a new city. And um, could you write a song to help me feel better? And so he wrote an email back and said, well, tell me about some of the stuff you're feeling. What, what are some of your emotions? And she, she wrote back, um, oh, sometimes I feel like I'm in the dark, you know, and, with, and you know, the world's spinning and I'm not, or whatever kind of stuff. And so he took all that and he wrote one line, and he, a chorus line. And he said, he said it's OK. Um, everything's going to be all right. Just breathe. And then he, he recorded that as a, as, a, as a line. And then he sent it out to his audience and said, could you guys just listen to this on headphones and sing over it and send me yours, your voice. So basically creating a chorus of, of people saying the same line. And then he wrote this song out of it. And I think, well, you'll hear it for yourself, but I think as testament to the power of community, the power of collaboration, the power of conversation, and really as an answer to that, that question of can the internet make you cry, can it make you emotional, I think, I think you'll, you'll, you'll agree that in hearing this, the answer is yes. Right now it feels like I forgot to turn the light on And things that looked so good yesterday are now shades of gray And it seems like the world is spinning while I'm standing still Oh, maybe I am spinning, I can't tell And then you say